Hi, my name is Becca Smith and my partner is Matt Sharon and we're interviewing James D. Higgins, a World War II vet. And it's October 30th, 2003 and we're with Mr. Forrest's class at RFA. Okay. Okay, what is your full name? Uh, James C. Higgins. Where and when were you born? I was born on December 29, 1922, in Decatur, Illinois. Okay. What was your pre-service education? A high school graduate. Did you have any pre-service employment? Yes, I worked as a grocery clerk in the Danahy Faxon store, and uh, I was also hired then uh, as a wholesale bakery salesman for the Jamestown Baking Company. Okay. When and how did you enter the service? I enlisted on uh, December 8th, 1942, and I entered the service in, uh, I was sworn in in Elmira, New York, and then transferred to uh, Fort Niagara for processing. Okay, and did the attack on Pearl Harbor affect your decision? Oh, yes. What were your feelings about it? What was what? Your feelings about Pearl Harbor being attacked? Well, it was a frightening event that uh, upset the whole world, and especially our country. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so would you say that the attack on Pearl Harbor was the main reason you decided to enlist? Oh, by all means. And um, did any of your friends enlist with you? No. no. Just you? Mm -hmm. And how did you break the news of your enlistment to your friends and family? Well, they knew ahead of time that I was going to enlist, and they were very supportive. I had a brother who was already in the service. In what branch did you decide to serve, and why? Well, this is an, an odd story. Uh, <clears throat> I used to enjoy hunting, and um, I thought nothing would be more fun than shooting airplanes down. So, uh, when you enlisted, you were given the privilege of uh, selecting the branch of service you wanted to serve them. And uh, as I was going through the induction center and taking all the various tests for uh, deciding where you're best fit, they wanted me to be an airplane mechanic. I think probably because I'd just uh, been out of high school for a couple of years and had taken high school physics and probably scored well with all the pulleys and levers and everything. And uh, I stuck to my guns so and said I'd prefer to go to an uh, airplane mechanic or to uh, an aircraft. And that's how I did. Okay, so when you became, when you enlisted, I mean, okay, where did you go for basic training? Fort Eustis, Virginia. <coughs> From the James River. <coughs> Can you recall any interesting experiences during your basic training? <laughs> I could give you many. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of something that would be appropriate. <laughs> our our uh, drill masters, uh, we had a uh, Sergeant Butler who could have filled in as a villain in a Hollywood movie. He had a disfiguring scar from his eye down to the corner of his mouth which distorted his uh, appearance, and he was mean as blazes, and uh, he was a very good drill sergeant. Uh, when he told you to do something, you did it. <laughs> and uh, But he was really uh, good for the job, because uh, mainly your training is to have you observe and obey. Uh, orders, no matter how ridiculous they might seem. Okay. 
So what did you train for specifically in basic training? Well, in basic training, you're not training specifically for anything. It's just a broad thing? Yeah. You're, okay. You're, you're subjected to uh, the rifle range and marching and close order drill, everything to make you uh, follow the instructions. So they make you a well-rounded soldier, would That's you say? That's their intent, yeah. Okay, so overall, were you satisfied with your basic training? Uh, yes, uh, I was um, enlightened a lot. Uh, a, a boy that slept in the bed next to me, nice looking young man, and he was from the South, but he was illiterate and uh, he was, even though he was married, he would get letters from his wife, but he couldn't read them. So he had a friend in another barracks, and the friend would come over and read his love letters to him. <laughs> And then uh, he would dictate what he wanted to tell his wife. So, <laughs> it, and then there were several that were uh, illiterate in our outfit, which amazed me. So, a lot of these people who went to basic training, did they have any schooling? Or well, some of them, obviously, he hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what unit were you assigned to? Well, it was the. It was just a, a basic training unit. Okay. And while I was there, they called my name out and um, said I was being sent to uh, Chicago, Illinois to take uh, a course in radio repair. So that ended my um, anti-aircraft training at that point. But then after completing the uh, course in the radio repair, I was transferred to Cape Cod and was on the cadre of the uh, 511th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion, which was just being activated. And I was part of the cadre for that. Okay. I might add, um, after building a radio at the uh, electrical school, I never saw another radio, <laughs> so it was a waste of time. So you bounced back from one thing to another in yes. basic training? Mm -hmm. A lot of it was a waste of your time? Quite a bit of it. And how long did you, how long were you at the radio re repairing at, school? Uh, it was a 13 week course. And why did they send you there? Because you... I suppose because they again thought I was mechanically inclined. And you didn't want to do anything with mechanics? <laughs> okay. I don't blame you. And, um, okay. Your highest rank held was sergeant. How did you achieve this rank? Uh, being a, uh, at the right, putting in the right place at the right time, I guess. Um, when I graduated from um, radio school, they made you a uh, tech which was a corporal with a T under it. And uh, then when they transferred me to uh, Camp Edwards, as I said, they were just forming a cadre. Mm -hmm. And the company officer, commanding officer, called me in one day and um, asked me different questions about identifying airplanes and tanks and one thing or another. And apparently I answered them all right. And he said, well, Higgins, I'm going to make you my intelligence sergeant, so. Do you think it's because they had, like, they had scarce people? Or do you really think it's because you scored good on tasks? Do you think they just... Well, I think primarily it was because, again, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I, I uh, just <laughs> lucked out, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so when you became a sergeant, did you enjoy having that rank? Oh, it was very nice because you got more pay and uh, a lot less work to do. <laughs> and I was in, then in uh, company headquarters with, uh, I served with a uh, battalion intelligence uh, lieutenant and uh, I was his assistant. And uh, every day after lunch, he would, uh, 
light up a cigar and put his feet on the desk and tell me what a fool I was not to transfer to the Air Force and get myself a $10,000 education on the government. And uh, he talked me into taking uh, the test and I transferred over to the uh, Air Force. And then they sent me to uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. And in Biloxi, uh, I really was tested for about a week. Uh, we had all sorts of tests, uh, endurance tests, color blindness tests, uh, coordination, uh, every, every type of test you can imagine. And I ended up, I qualified for uh, pilot, bombardier, and navigator, the three. And from there, I was transferred to uh, Texas A&M University for the pre for the uh, college training before going to pre-flight. Okay. So, <clears throat> you ended up in the Air Force part? Yeah. And that's where you stayed? No. Then you went somewhere else? <laughs> where did you go after that? Well, uh, we took our college training and uh, there were a thousand of us in the squadron. And on April 1st of 44, the commanding general of the armed forces uh, sent a telegram and they gathered all of us into this big rec hall and uh, said that in order that you may have an earlier opportunity for engaging the enemy, all former members of the ground forces, which was me, are hereby eliminated this day. So out of the thousand of us, 900 of us uh, were washed out immediately. This happened all over the country. Uh -huh. And uh, they sent me then to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina in the infantry. So uh, you can see I, <laughs> I never saw a shot of a plane, never saw a radio. <laughs> never got into an airplane, and now I'm in the infantry. <laughs> Would you have rather been in something else than the infantry? In retrospect, I am very happy I was where I was at. I uh, enjoyed the infantry, and I felt that uh, I, w I was proud to be an infantryman. Okay, so when were you sent overseas? On uh, October 20th of... Uh, and where were you sent? We left out of uh, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and we landed in Marseille, France. Okay. Were you nervous about going over there, or did you know what to expect, or did you hear stories? Well, yeah, I think um, <laughs> I, uh, I'll tell you. Frankly, when uh, we sailed out of New York Harbor, every man aboard was on, on deck, you know, and you watched the Statue of Liberty until it was out of sight, and it was absolutely quiet. And I think every man thought, I wonder if I'll see her again, you know. I mean, it was a very emotional thing at the time. And a lot of men didn't see her again. <clears throat> okay, um, so you went to France. What's the name of it? Marseille? Marseille. Marseille. Okay, and when and where did you first come into combat? Say that again. When and where did you first come into combat? Well, uh, we landed, as I say, uh, or we left on October 20th, and we were in combat on November 1st. We relieved the um, 45th Infantry Division okay. took over their position. Okay. And what was your reaction to this first, how you overtook their position? How do you what? What was your reaction to that? Uh, well, you're, when you're first in combat, you're very green. 
and then basic training and all you were taught how to dig foxholes and one thing or another. But you tried to get by with the shallowest hole you could dig because it was a, a lot of work. And uh, I remember the first night we were right by a uh, artillery battery and uh, again they told us to dig in and we dug a little shallow foxhole and then the artillery came in and uh, you should have seen the dirt fly then <laughs> started making their holes much deeper. So. Okay, so when you went into combat, were you told well in advance or was it a spur of a moment thing? Well, we knew we were going to be relieving uh, the 45th Infantry, yeah. Okay, so it wasn't like November 1st, they came and told you that you were going to be doing it? No. It was more like a week ahead? We, we knew they were sending us uh, by truck up to relieve the uh, okay. yeah. 45th. And what was your reaction to seeing the first casualties of war? It was very uh, painful because um, the first dead soldier I saw was a friend of mine and not two weeks before we left uh, Fort Bragg, he and I had gone into uh, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina together on a weekend pass. His name was Joe Bartkowski and uh, he was the first uh, dead soldier I saw and it, it was made quite an emotional impact at the time. Okay. At any point during the war, did you feel that you wouldn't make it out alive? At times. Several times. Okay. okay. And we know that you lost your leg in the war. And how did you lose your life? I stepped on a, um, what they call a shoe mine, which is about the size of a cigar box and has eight ounces of uh, TNT in it. And the cover is hinged and it's covered with earth. And then when you step on it, it's designed so that the cover pushes down and hits a firing pin and takes the pin out and that sets off the explosion. And, uh, it's just a very simple device, yeah. but very effective. How deep do they put it in the ground? Uh, just barely cover with really? earth, yeah. Usually, it, usually you can see where the earth has been disturbed, yeah. but not always. Yeah. Would course, it be in like a pattern? Uh, sometimes. Oh. Uh, right after we went into combat, uh, Lieutenant Lowe's was a uh, friend of mine. Uh, even I was a, though I was a non-com, he used to go into the uh, non-com uh, orderly or uh, day center with us and have a beer. He's a real regular guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a little clearing beside this path, and maybe the size of this room, and. Uh, one of his men walked in there and stepped on a mine, and uh, a shoe mine. Mm -hmm. And then Lieutenant Lowe's went rushing in to help him, and he stepped on one and fell on another. He lost both his arm and a leg. And at that point, they stopped everyone from going in and called him our platoon. And we went in and we took uh, 17 shoe mines out of an area about this size. And um, these shoe box mines, that's what you said they were? Shoe mines. Shoe mines. Mm -hmm. um, S-H-U-M-I-N-E. Would it generally, was it like fatal or did it just? No, they were, they were designed to maim. Uh, the Germans, I think if I recall right, they figured it took about 10 individuals to take care of one end of the one wounded soldier. So uh, you were worth more alive than dead to them because 
it tied up so many other people mm -hmm. down the line. To like the care. medics? Yeah. Okay. And then what was the date you lost your leg? Do you know? Oh yes, April 16th, 1944, four days after Roosevelt died. Okay, so when you attained your injury to your leg, how did you feel mentally? Did you, did you even know or were you in shock? I was very upset. <laughs> uh, you know, your grandmother, uh, she and I were uh, engaged. And I thought, you know, would she still want to marry me that now that I'm in this shape? Because I had never really seen amputees. And the only one I could remember was an old man that used to sit by the uh, Steuben Trust Company in Hornell, New York, <laughs> with a box of pencils <laughs> and a can for donations. You know? <laughs> and I thought, I hope that I'm don't come to that, you know. <laughs> How did Nani react? Well, she was, uh, of course, heartbroken, but uh, there was never any thought that uh, we wouldn't get married, yeah. yeah. Okay. How did your light injury change your life? Well, in many ways, I guess, uh, it... Uh, directed me into the uh, job that I had with the Veterans Administration. And <clears throat> other than that, I mean, I never felt that I was uh, disabled, mm -hmm. And what job specifically did you go into? Well, I was chief of the prosthetic and sensory aid service at the VA hospital in Albany. Would you ever would you have ever gone into this job if that hadn't no, happened? No. Okay, now back to this. What was your life what was life like on the day to day basis in Europe? In the army? Mm hmm Well, <clears throat> every day was different. You never knew just what the day would hold for you. And uh, some days uh, in the wintertime my the line was more or less stagnant, but yet you had uh, patrols and uh, we, we were not too active on the front line. We, our, our responsibility was providing the ammunition and uh, removing uh, roadblocks and any, any minor engineering things, mm -hmm. removing mines until the engineers came along and did a more complete job. Ours was an emergency uh, um, system. Okay. Did you ever get to go out? Or was it more of a, like, go out to town? Oh. You mean to have a, 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 a drink? time? Yeah. No. No? <laughs> okay. No. And uh, what was the food like? Not too good. You see, uh, the rations are broken down. Uh, they start at division, and then they go to regiment, and then to battalion. And regiment or division takes what they think looks good, mm -hmm. and then uh, regiment taps in, and they take the lot that looks good, and that leaves the infantryman up front with what's left over. And fortunately in my job, lots of times I'd have to go back to regiment uh, to get supplies, ammunition and the like. And my driver and I used to try to time it so we'd get back to regiment at meal time. <laughs> and we'd eat much better then. Um, did you and your fellows get along? Did. Did you get along with Oh, your got other along group? fine with everyone. Yeah. 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 No fights? No fights. Okay. Some were more of a problem than others, but... Uh, mm -hmm. And what did you do in your spare time? 
sleep <laughs> and play uh, cards, play poker. So you retired a lot? Yeah, he would be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> How did you keep in touch with your families and friends back home? Well, by what they call email, um, or uh, email rather. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip there. <laughs> uh, email, it was uh, letters that were photographed and uh, reduced in size and uh, emailed. And it was, the letters had to be uh, censored by an officer in your unit to be sure you weren't giving away secrets and so that uh, it, it was a lot of it was a waste of time I thought but um, because they had to be checked did to, you to be sure that you weren't telling where your division was uh -huh. and all that sort of thing yeah did you find that you had to be impersonal yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay um. What was the most interesting or inspiring thing you experienced during your service? Wow. <laughs> most interesting and inspiring thing. Well, I'll tell you what inspired me probably more than anything. When I was a patient in uh, a Paris hospital, uh, one day this soldier came in, in regular, uh, regular uniform, and he came up to my bed and started talking with me, and I wondered why he singled, singled me out. And we talked quite a while, and uh, he said, would you like to see an artificial leg? And I said, oh yes. You know. So he raised his trouser leg, and he was wearing a limb just like I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started dancing with the nurses and, <laughs> and my morale went from very low to sky high, you know, after that. Because he showed you. Yeah. You know, and the Army, to give them credit, they sent uh, different uh, amputees with different combinations, like both legs off or an arm and a leg. But all these men had been uh, rehabilitated and they sent them overseas to go through these hospitals like I was in just to show the patients uh, what could be done. Mm -hmm. and it was a great morale booster. Yeah, I want to mention too, you were asking about letters and uh, when I got hurt, I immediately, uh, the next day I sent a letter off to your grandmother and to uh, my parents mm -hmm. and told them just what had happened, that I wasn't blind or anything, that I didn't want them to worry too much. And <clears throat> uh, my sister and her husband were home at the time from Pennsylvania and they sent uh, 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 telegrams and everything, radiograms to me which I never received. And uh, each day at mail call, I'd wait for my name to be called, and never. And it went on weeks. And finally one day they said, Higgins. And I said, here. And I got this letter. And it was from Gert Witter, who used to run the uh, market basket store in Westfield, Pennsylvania. And she had read about my injury, and she was on my bread route when I was in the, before the war, and she sent me a letter. <laughs> that was the only letter that I got. <laughs> and then, uh, I think it was in July, finally all my mail caught up with me. Brownies and cookies, and they had turned to dust. And <laughs> A mess, but <laughs> that's funny. Okay, who do you remember best from your service and why? 
Uh, well, <clears throat> I had a few very close friends. Uh, Lieutenant Eddie was our platoon leader. He was a very fine man. I liked him a lot. And Bert Edelbach was a uh, dear friend. Uh, I went to his wedding in, in Long Island, Kitty and I. And <clears throat> and Huck Long was uh, a good friend. He's now a retired major general. And he was in my, I was his platoon sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> So you're a So I had a general serve under me at one time. That's <laughs> So was Lieutenant Eddie just a really nice guy? He was a real fine person. He went to the University of Vermont and uh, I guess he was a football player there. Mm -hmm. He was uh, very fair and uh, very nice. What experiences left the greatest impressions on you? Uh, <clears throat> well, when I was a uh, patient in uh, McGuire Hospital in Richmond, Virginia, uh, I was in the kidney ward at the time, and uh, I saw a group of men coming down. One of them was in uniform and he got nearer and I saw his 100th Division patch and it was our commanding general, General Barres, whose home was in Virginia, Richmond. And uh, he and uh, General Patton, after the war, came back to the States on a war bond drive and he was just uh, in the States for two or three days. But out of that time, he took time to go over to the hospital and look up uh, the men that had served in his uh, division. And uh, he had his brother with him and uh, an aide. He sat on the edge of my bed for 45 minutes talk, telling uh, everything that had happened after I got hurt and if he could do anything to help. And, you know, I thought an outstanding example of a fine general. <laughs> and when did you come home to that to Virginia? Uh, May twentieth, I think it was. We got back in '44 into uh, LaGuardia Field. Okay. Um, what was life like when you came back home? What was what? Life like when you came back home. Uh, <clears throat> Well, that's sort of brilliant. <laughs> uh, life at the hospital where I was uh, really was some of the best times I've ever had. <laughs> uh, your grandmother came down and uh, we shared a uh, house with two other couples that were amputees and um, we, we just had a real fine time and the neighbors in the uh, neighborhood, they adopted us and uh, we had parties about every weekend and it was just a, a real fine time when we weren't being treated. <laughs> um, what medals or citations did you earn? Well, I had the uh, silver of the uh, uh, Purple Heart and the Bronze, bronze Star with a cluster. And our um, regiment had the uh, Presidential Unit Citation. And, and everyone had a good conduct medal and that sort of junk. <laughs> <laughs> Why was your infantry division awarded the presidential unit citation? It's for uh, uh, outstanding uh, accomplishment. 
in a battle. In what specific accomplishment? Ours, we, we took this uh, heavily fortified Hill 509, I think it was, and um, it was a strategic uh, holding. Okay. And why did you receive all the stars, like the brown stars and the... Uh, nothing special. <laughs> a lot of people got them? A lot did, yeah. 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 Just for recognition? Yeah, it was for doing maybe something a little special, but nothing that ranks so uh, very high. <laughs> Once you came back home, was it hard to adjust to normal living? Uh, no, not really. Okay. And what employment did you do after the war? I think we touched on that. Well, <clears throat> I went uh, to the VA house or to the VA in Washington to uh, see about having a new limb made because when we got in the service was a temporary prosthesis. And while there I inquired about possible employment and uh, they sent me to uh, personnel and had me uh, take a test and uh, they were explaining that they were trying to establish this program that I was in throughout the country. And uh, it was still on paper and uh, then on July 1st by Congress appropriated the funds and everything and uh, there were uh, I think 13 of us took the test and six of us passed and uh, we were assigned to different regional offices around the country. And where did you go? And I went to Albany. Mm -hmm. You wanted to go there, right? Yeah, primarily. Did you get a choice? Yeah, we had a choice. Um, in fact, we had talked about going to Denver. And um, it was so far away from the family and everything. And at that time, air travel wasn't anything like you have now. Mm -hmm. And so we opted for Albany. And I've always been glad that we did because I enjoyed uh, working there. Okay, did you, re did, did you maintain contact with the people you served with? With some. Mm -hmm. By letters or? Yeah, email now and uh, there's only about two alive that are uh, still, that I'm still in contact with. Hmm. And how many in the beginning? Oh, probably six or seven. Uh -huh. okay. Overall, were you happy with your decision to serve? In the service? Mm -hmm. Very much so, yeah. Would you advise young people of today to enlist in the Army? I would. Why? Well, I think it's a good training and uh, a good experience. Mm -hmm. If not in the Army, why the Peace Corps or something like that. Okay, and do you think people's view of the military has changed since World War II? Uh, yes. I think they're more receptive now. What do you mean by Well, before World War II, uh, Anyone in the army was sort of viewed as a misfit, you know. And then when uh, Pearl Harbor came along, uh, everyone that could walk and was healthy <laughs> was put into the service about. And um, well, winning World War II, of course, was a great accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And the uh, since then, we've had the Vietnam War and the Korean War, and now this present in uh, Iraq. 
the poor uh, Vietnam guys, I think they got sort of the bad end of the stick, you know, as far as recognition. Yeah, sort of shunned. They were treated more as villains rather than heroes. They shouldn't have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, my last question. In closing, how did your military experience change your life? Well, <clears throat> it's hard to say. Um, made me more appreciative of uh, our country, I think. And, uh, it uh, gives you a feeling of uh, satisfaction that you were able to serve your country. Mm -hmm. And plus it changed what job you went to after, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Not bleeding or anything. <laughs> Thought was interesting. Uh, when I got hurt, uh, I was on a litter outside of uh, a tent hospital, like a mesh unit. And uh, the uh, Surgeon General of the United States was over in uh, Europe making a tour of the field hospitals. And I was in a litter laying on the ground waiting to go into uh, the, the tent hospital. And this many star general <laughs> got down on his knees and was talking with me and uh, asking me when I was hurt and uh, how soon I got medical care. And uh, he wanted to know all about my injury. And then he ruffled my hair and he said, son, he said, when you're through, you'll be as good as new. And I thought, boy, he's talking in the air. <laughs> but it was sort of an unusual thing to have him there at that time, I thought. What was his name? Well, I don't remember his name, but he was the, uh, the Surgeon General of the uh, U.S. Army. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>